But like, I didn't even really know what it was, like what my dream was more in a, in a solidified sort of way until like two years ago. And so for me, chasing dreams is like, is a journey. It's like, for me, it's the transition from ethereal to concrete. that so okay hi and uh welcome to the dream chasers podcast i am samantha and i have the lovely laura ellis um here with me today um so laura and i know each other because we both belong and i hate calling it this but we both belong to the entrepreneurs forever i know what you mean i know <laughs> it used to be mansman foundation and then they changed it to e forever and i'm just like i can't yeah. it's just such a dumb name um and i let them know it all the time <laughs> I'm like i love <laughs> i love the organization it's a terrible name um so Laura is actually one of the first people I asked. To oh, really? Be, yeah, you are. And we oh. just never managed to make it. I never managed to get my shit together enough to make it work. Um, so Laura does, and please correct me if I'm wrong. So you do acupuncture and Chinese medicine. Yes. Is that correct? That's correct. So um, for those other folks who are idiots, what exactly does that mean? Oh, my God. It means so many things. Um, so... Acupuncture and we call it oriental medicine mm -hmm. um, because it can be also Korean. There's Japanese influences, okay. things like that. It encompasses acupuncture, which most people understand as like sticking needles in right. people to make them feel better. But it encompasses a lot more than that, too. Um, really big part of what we do is Chinese herbal medicine. So okay. herbal formulas, prescriptive herbal formulas, um, cupping, you know, like yep. the I got in a fight with an octopus in one. Yeah, was, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I've, 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 I've seen the after effects of those on, yeah. on like TikTok and stuff. I'm like, oh, yes. that sounds horrifying. No, it's great. It's wonderful. <laughs> it looks horrifying. Yeah, but yeah, and gua sha, same thing. Looks horrifying. Creates these like big ugly bruises, but is like an amazing muscle releaser. So okay. you know, like body work, things like that. Good. Lots of stuff are included under that umbrella. So it's it's a medical clinic. It's under the umbrella of Oriental medicine. Okay. So um, we're sort of careful about like. We're not a spa, you know, right. like you don't tip us for what we do. Right. Like we're like in certain states, we would be considered doctors, even like PCPs, okay. you know, um, not in Pennsylvania because, Pennsylvania. you know, Pennsylvania. Right. But yeah, <laughs> but you know, New Mexico, Florida, we would be, you know, I'd be Dr. Laura Ellis and okay. you know, that sort of thing. So, so, uh, so in Pennsylvania, what kind of like requirements do you have to have to, to do this? Well, everything that you would in New Mexico or Florida as well, it, you just get a different title for it. But okay. so what you have to do is you have to get a master's degree. Um, and the master's degree is three to four years, depending on how fast you go through it. Mm -hmm. Normally four years. Um, okay. It is, um, you have to pass a total of five different board exams. Um, <laughs> one of them is, is, Easy. It's like okay. a clean needle technique. It's like okay. a one day okay. how to be clean, you know, with your needles. Right. Um, and then uh, one of them is an herb board. And Pennsylvania does not require that to be licensed. If you don't have that one, then you can't prescribe Chinese herbs. Okay. But um, we do at my clinic. Me and my associate are both... Um, we're board both certified. board certified to practice Chinese so herbalism. Fancy. I know. <laughs> so yeah, so you have to have all four of those board, three to four of those boards, right? Um, and then you pay the state of Pennsylvania to be licensed as well. Then, oh my gosh, yeah, that's a lot. It's a lot. <laughs> yeah, I he, honestly like for so um, people don't realize it. No, yeah, because like, like in in the in the meetings, like we never really talk about. You know, we don't really get in the weeds of like exactly what it is that you do. We just talk right. about the business aspects. Of right, it. right. So I wasn't sure exactly, yeah, like the difference between you and a spa. Yeah, right. Yeah, people are like, oh, so did you learn this over the course of a weekend? <laughs> and I'm like, oh my god, did you go like on a retreat? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it was four years long, hundred and twenty five thousand dollars later. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. Oh dear God. Yeah. Um. So yeah. So um. So, so we do this thing. Mm -hmm. So thank you for coming and doing this thing with me. So I have to read the poem. Mm -hmm. One of these days, Langston Hughes, the state's going to be like, stop it. <laughs> <laughs> but I love it. And it's all out of respect. Because um, I feel like it encompasses so many things. So Harlem by Langston Hughes. What happens to a dream deferred? Does it dry up like a raisin in the sun or fester like a sore and then run? Does it stink like rotten meat 
or crust and sugar over like a syrupy sweet. Maybe it just sags like a heavy load, or does it explode? So, Laura Ellis, with all of the numbers and letters after your name. <laughs> um, good Lord. L-A-C-M-S-A-O-M. I don't know. Uh, N-C-C-A-O-M. <laughs> yep. Laura Ellis. When you think of dream chasing, mm-hmm. what does that mean to you? I thought about this earlier today because I knew you were going to ask me this. And I was like, this is what the one question. Does, what is, this is the yeah. one question. What does this mean to me? And, you know, it, it's hard because, you know, I've always considered myself the kind of person who has a lot of dreams. My imagination's always been active and, like, moving towards something. And But when I was a kid, it was really, like, it was a dream. Like, it was something of my unconscious that kind of only comes up in dreams it was ethereal lofty like I didn't know I I knew I wanted something like I had that urge and motivation to move towards something but I never knew what it was until honestly maybe two years ago okay yeah even though I've been practicing acupuncture now for eight years on my own you know I graduated eight years ago but like I didn't even really know what it was, like what my dream was more in a, in a solidified sort of way until like two years ago. And so for me, chasing dreams is like, is a journey. It's like, for me, it's the transition from ethereal to concrete. Okay. Yeah. So what happened two years ago that... Well, I, we were coming out of lockdown and COVID mm-hmm. uh, about two years ago, maybe yeah. three, yeah, you know, two. like two-ish, Took you know. Change, yeah. yeah, and that, um, you know, not to minimize what happened, but for me, lockdown was a really good thing. You know, it, mm-hmm. for me, I came... I came, I came through it well, I came out of it well, and it forced me to reconsider where I'm at, what I'm doing. I, when lockdown hit, I slept for like three days, <laughs> and I was like, well, clearly I was burning out. This was yeah. not working for me. What I was doing was not working for me, so yeah. a lot of reevaluation, and um, this might be kind of um, scandalous to say, I, I love what I do. I love my patients. I've never been in love with Chinese medicine. Okay. It was always like a tool, you know, like I, like I kind of meandered onto this path just like one step at a time. Again, this like not knowing quite where I'm going, but taking the next step and like something else concrete comes Mm -hmm. up. Right. And that's how I found acupuncture and Chinese medicine. And it just fit all the boxes of what I wanted to do. I wanted to work with people individually. I wanted to connect with people. I wanted to help on a mind, body, spirit level. Acupuncture does all that. Um, so I love that it allowed me to do that. But, you know, there are people who go into Chinese medicine for the love of medicine and for the love of how deep and scholarly it can be. And mm. I've, I've never experienced that. And so I kind of came through lockdown being like, I don't want to do this forever. I don't want to do this even when I'm 70. I don't necessarily want to retire being a solo practitioner and, you know, that's not, that's not really what I want to do with my life. And so what I, there's like, you know, again, like one step in front of the other things unfolded and even things that I don't even remember anymore. But like, Mm -hmm. I know that what they're, what that unfolding led me to was, you know, what I really want to build is a business that I would be proud to sell when I'm ready to sell it. Yeah. And that's what sparked everything for me. Like, yeah, (laughs) that's totally valid. Yeah. I, I, we sometimes, I think as Americans, we, we have this idea that our vocation has to be our avocation, and I don't mm. think it necessarily does. Yeah. I, had a very, I had a very similar um, realization, not because of the pandemic, but because of the lawsuit. Oh, yeah. And so, um, for those of you who don't know, I have a former uh, landlord who sued us for half a million dollars, and it, and it led to, is leading to still... Seven months into the dissolution of the company. Um, but that forced me to take a step back and go, is this what I want? Yeah. And I fucking hate retail. <laughs> I had three stores at one point and I realized I fucking hate yeah. retail. Yeah. And why 
you know, but we get, we, you know, we get on that, we're, we're working, right? We're just yeah. doing the thing. We get up every day. We're good at what we do. And we're just, we're plugging away at it. And we sometimes forget. Yeah. That we, we're not loving it. Right. Yes. Yeah. Um, I remember when, um, at the meeting, I, I think, I think you were at this meeting and Terry was like, you know, what's the plan? I'm like, I'm shutting this shit down. And like the look on his face was like, wait, <laughs> <laughs> you've been spending 12 years building. I'm like, yep. Shutting it down. Yeah. Shutting it down. You know, uh, could I have fought it harder? Yeah, probably. But you know, why? But why? Yeah. Exactly. And it, and, it, and it increasingly became a thing that, that I realized I was starting to resent. Mm. That's huge. It's huge. Because it's not my avocation. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm an actor. Yeah. And, you know, and some people might view that as being pipe dreamy or whatever, but... It's no more pipe dreamy than having a soap company. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it's fair. really not. That's fair. <laughs> it's really not. Yeah. You know, anytime you take a hobby and turn it into a business, mm-hmm. it's, it's kind of pipe dreamy. Right. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I, yeah. I think it's important, whether it's a vacation, whether it's a lockdown, whether it's a lawsuit, <laughs> uh, I think it's important for people to take a step back and um, why am I doing this? Right. And, and for it to be okay, that it's not the reason why other people are doing it, you know, like, especially, I feel like there's a lot, you know, in the health and wellness field of, oh, I just want to heal people. Oh, I just want to make people feel better. And certainly that's part of it. I, I love it when my patients come in and say, I feel so much better than I did last week. Like Mm -hmm. that gives me life and joy, but that's not, that's not my driving force in terms of my, my dreams. Like, like I, I have big dreams for, for my clinic. I have big dreams for having lots of practitioners being able to help a lot of people, but it's not for the love of medicine and it's not even for the love of healing. It's for the love of um, community, right? Mm. To build something that's a big network of support. And for me, that looks like a business. And that's not, you know, that's kind of um, like to admit that, especially to health and wellness people can sometimes you know, they can kind of look at you askance at kind of like, well, you're just doing it for the money. Uh-huh. I mean, like, there's nothing wrong with doing something for a there's lot of money. There's nothing wrong. So Listen. long as you're not stomping on other people for it, right? right? But also, like, it's not... Like, you got to pay your It's you gotta more pay than the money. Yeah, it's like, right. it's the money, it's the community, it's, it's so much more than that. And that's to How me what business is. How much did you say is. your degree cost? Oh, yeah, right? 125000 mm-hmm. you you You're entitled to recoup some of that. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry, you are. Oh, yeah. Um... Yeah, again, mm-hmm. I, had a, I had a very similar thing because, like, I did community theater for 35 years. Mm-hmm. And I would do, and I'm not kidding, 12 shows a year. Wow. Some years, six, seven, not uncommon. Six and seven was pretty standard, but there were a couple of 12 shows a year. Wow. Years. And when you're overlapping, you don't have time to realize that you're kind of miserable. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and that's what the pandemic did for me, honestly, was made me sit back and go, okay, I can't do theater. I haven't, I haven't been in a full play in five years. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. That's a long time. It's a long, now I've done other things. I've done readings. I love doing readings. I love doing Mm. readings. I do. I really like it. Um, Developing scripts and things. That's, that's fun for me. I've been doing all these classes. I love that. I, I had a weird thing that was happening where I would go to these auditions and, and I went like almost a year and didn't book anything. Mm. And it was weird. I'm like, what's going on? And I think, you know, I've talked about this. Like I'm a big believer in that the universe will tell you what you're supposed to be doing. Yeah. And I'm like, why am I not getting, why is this so hard? Like, why was the soap so hard? Why is the, why is trying to pursue a professional theater career so hard? It's because I'm not supposed to be doing that. Yeah. So, and I kept going to these like theater auditions and they're like, oh, you should do television. I don't watch TV guys. Like, I don't, <laughs> like I don't, I don't, but, but in, in sort of like taking a step back and looking at it, I realized that the kind of acting that I like to do, the kind, like there's the actual style of the acting that I like to do mm-hmm. is very television friendly. Okay. You know, I am not a performer. Yeah. I'm an actor. They're not necessarily the same thing. 
You know what I mean? I can see that. I can yeah. see that. Now that you say that, yeah. I can see that. I mean, like, there's nothing wrong with being, like, I have friends who are performers, like, they wake up in the morning and they, you know, like, <laughs> hello, here I am. Everyone <laughs> bow to me. And like, and there's nothing wrong with that. Like, there's yeah. zero wrong with that. But I realize that's not who I am. Right. Um, I've produced shows where I'm like, cool, we're not going to do a curtain call. <laughs> I don't like curtain calls. Like, it's not, for me, it's not the part I like. Yeah. It's, it's the... Here's a character. Let me slide as much into the skin of this person as I can mm. and portray them in the most realistic manner possible. That's that is TV. That's that is TV. TV yeah. And so, like, like shit. Now what am I gonna do? Um, so I've been having to watch. And I'm like, okay. So now, so now I feel like there's stuff out there that I could stomach being. <laughs> like, I couldn't do. I couldn't do a lot of it. But but you have to take that step back. Mm-hmm. Yes. And be really honest with yourself and realize that sometimes the thing you thought you wanted. Right. Ain't it. Right. Well, and for me, it was scary, too, because I had no idea what I would do if it wasn't acupuncture, because that's what I was doing. And I was doing really well at it. Like, I, you know, had my best year, almost a six figure year in 2019. Right. And yeah, I was building up to a really good pace. Like everything was going the way it should. Right. Quote, Mm -hmm. should. And so like. So to take a step back and to reevaluate and to go, what if I was supposed to be doing something else is really terrifying Mm -hmm. because like, what if that something else isn't what you're doing now when you're already established in what you're doing now and it's working, you know, and for me just sort of worked out because I took that step back and I was like, you know what, like I kind of gave myself the freedom to be like, you know what, I just want to build a business that I can sell. I like, I'm not going to do acupuncture forever. I'm going to enjoy it until I'm ready to stop. And then mm-hmm. I can sell this and then go on to whatever else it happens to be. Mm-hmm. And it just so happened to turn out that business management is what I'm supposed to be doing, at least right now. Yeah. Because I love, and I never would have thought that yeah. I would have loved it or been good at it, kind of like with TV, right? Like, right. I never would have looked at it as like, oh, yeah, I want to manage people. No. See, that's the part of, of, right? of owning the business that I hated. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> See, so, but I, everyone's different. So and, far, I don't mind it. I'm pretty good at it. And the strategic planning, I've always loved that. Like, yeah, yeah I, I actually love it. And then I get to sprinkle in some seeing patients there, too, for that, like, connection fire right. that you get. Yeah. Community building. All right. And, and, I, and I have, like, being in the meetings, I've, I've noticed that that, you're absolutely right, like, that seems to be the thing when you get excited. Yeah. It's like, oh, we got this, and we got the new we got the new girl up front, and so I coordinated this, and this got coordinated, and I have this many hours, and I can have Wednesdays off, and, to, you know, and so. Yes, I so love like, that. Yeah. It's like, seeing you, like, talk about that, I'm like, oh, okay, yeah. there it is. That's the thing. Um, yeah, yeah. I like making. Mm-hmm. I love the making. Mm, yeah. I love making. The creativity the of it. The creative of it. Mm-hmm. Like, I love, like, and, and. And I love making soap. Soap is an expensive thing to make. Mm. If you're not going to sell, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. in, order, in order to make big enough batches that the cost of it makes sense, you have to buy, you know. And it's like, if you are buying a handmade bar of soap and it's less than $10, those people are screwing themselves. Really? I mean, it really, especially yeah. like super duper small. Like I had to start buying in fifty five gallon drums to make it make sense to keep my prices at seven fifty. Wow, wow. Is that not including time either? Is that just it's like not materials? Time. It's okay. Materials. Wow. It's just because it's, it's, if, if you're doing like the the all natural, yeah. it just gets super duper spendy, yeah. and it's very time intensive, mm-hmm. and it's space intensive because you have to you know you have to dry it for so long, and so then that gets you know so it becomes very very expensive. I love doing it. Mm-hmm. Um, I recently discovered uh, resin. Oh. And resin, I'm noticing, hits that same part of my soul yeah. that the soap making did. Oh, cool. So I'm like, oh, I'll play with this one. <laughs> um, but again, like, in order to to make it financially feasible, you have to, like, buy, like, the quantities. And so doing something like a service. Yeah is more financially feasible. Well, I've struggled with that a lot because yeah. with acupuncture, it's one-on-one mm-hmm. and, you know, you can, only person, do so much. you can only do so much. The person has to show up in order to get paid unless you have a really strict no-show policy, mm-hmm. um, which we have like a semi-strict no-show yeah. policy, but still like they have to show up in order to get paid. And there's only so many places you can be at once, you know, yeah. really like, you know, four rooms at once, it would be kind of the max ish you know right. i mean some people run more than that but like not much like it's it's scalable right. to only a point like what's scalable right. for me is practitioners right yeah right. so it's like a time for and then you can take a, like a cut of what they're doing because you're bringing in the people right yes yeah and that doing the sense. management of it so yeah so it is it's not 
scaling is hard sometimes, you know, scaling whether is it's hard. products or whether it's service, yeah. it's scaling is, um, scaling is super tough. It, it takes some creativity actually. Yeah. No, because you, you have to juggle all the things. Right. And figure out how to make this work. I love that question. Like, it's not like, can I, or it's not like, how? what if I could? Yeah, it's how. Like, how could I make okay, this like, work? Well, the, but I, I think in the, in the looking for the how to make something work, you, A, you discover a lot of things about yourself. Yeah. And you discover your, um, your deal breakers. Yeah. Which I think is really important yeah. to figure out what your deal breakers are. Um. But also, you start to realize other things you're good at. Like, yeah. I would never have thought I was good at marketing. Oh, yeah. But I love marketing. Marketing is fun. That's just fun. <laughs> <laughs> it's just fun. Like, it's like, I mean, and there's like, a, there's a cool psychology behind marketing. Yeah. And, and in the wrong hands, I mean, which, you know, we all know that there's some wrong hands dealing with marketing. Like, you. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of money to be made. That's not how my brain works. But like, uh. It's just fun. Yeah. I enjoy it. But I have friends who are in their own business and the thought of having to do marketing, like that's the thing that makes them like cry yeah. in, the, in the shower. That's me. I don't love it. I finances. Love it. <laughs> finances and organizing people, that makes me cry in the shower. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, marketing, that kind of stuff, I absolutely love. Mm -hmm. All right. So we need to talk about something here. So my kids have done remote learning and mm -hmm. they've done like cyber schools. Yeah. But in your little bio here. Um, you said that you were unschooled. Yeah. Now, since elementary, like all the way through like high school, you were unschooled? From third, yeah, from third grade all the way through high school, I was what, unschooled. What does that mean to be so, unschooled? Unschooled, is, it's homeschooling, right? Okay. It's a, a, we were under the umbrella of homeschooling according to PA law. We were homeschoolers. Right. But it's kind of like a style of homeschooling. And unschooling is completely student directed. Okay. Um, to varying degrees of radicalness, depending on the parents. But the way that we did it was, um, I have a younger brother. It's just the two of us. Okay. Um, we were allowed to choose what we learned when we learned it. And our parents, their role was facilitators. Okay. You know, they were there to say, hey, why don't you try this? Or, hey, like, let's sign you up for blank. You know, like, they tried to introduce us to as many things as possible and they their role was to watch us and to see like where that spark happens where like our eyes light up and we get really interested in something right. and then dive into that and out of uh one interest a whole education can come from that so um you it's know, almost like college yeah kind of yeah, yeah kind you, of, you only focus like, on things yeah you focus on things and you know like um you know, like one of the, one of the things <laughs> we were kind of reminded of this recently. My mom found um, my brother's first website when he was eight years old, and he like had a, a bio or something like that on it, right? And he was talking in his like little bio about how he likes to sell Star Wars cards. Like he would buy a whole box of like packs of Star Wars cards, okay. and he would like to sell them to his friends, right? And he was talking about how much he sold each one for and how many he had left mm -hmm. and things like that, right? But, like, by allowing him to, like, dive into this and buy a whole box of unopened, you know, like, packs of Star Wars cards, mm -hmm. he was learning business and finances, mm -hmm. right? He was learning about math. So it's that kind of thing, right? So, like, I really liked, you know, uh, writing. I love to write yeah. stories. And so I got... I w it was easy for me to get my sort of reading and writing education in there. But then um, also the different things I would write about, I'd have to go and like research this sort of like scientific idea in order to be able to write about it then, right? Like right. that sort of thing. Like you facilitate okay. and you, you push the kid to, um, to explore all they can about something until they're not interested and then you let them move on to the next thing. So my son, my, my youngest, he's 15, is obsessed with his game. Right, mm -hmm. this is what, make, what makes me think of, um, and part of this game it's called um, Pet Simulator. Part of this game is buying and trading and selling and earning these pets. Okay, and there's different levels of these pets, and some pets are worth this much, and some pets are worth this much. This child will talk for. 30, 40 minutes about how, like, statistically, the odds of him getting this thing is this much, and this is this much, yes. and, and this is this is worth this much, and and so and so bought this this pet for this much, and it like he overvalued it, and this one screwed him over because you know all yeah. about this really intangible thing of these digitized pets. Yeah, and I remember I I, I said to my husband, I'm like, 
he should be like a statistician or something. <laughs> you know, because like he really likes that whole like the process of figuring out the value yeah. of something and the marketability of something and what that means. Yeah. You know, it's like if I have a humongous jungle cat or whatever the heck, I don't know, <laughs> he starts talking and he goes over my head at the time. I'm like, I don't, rainbow, unicorns, what are you saying? But, um, but he'll just like, he'll go into, you know, how many there are. And, and he researches like the, the game programmer and like, well, Preston, you know, released this many and this, that, and the other. And, and, you know, and, and what that all means and the value of those things. And I feel like for him in doing that, all of a sudden he's gotten really good at math because mm-hmm. there's so much math involved with that. So when you, when you were saying that, that's, that's really, yeah, I, that's I, the idea of it. Yeah. Well, and so like, so were your parents educators and that's why they decided to, so nope. what was the impetus behind? Oh, that's a good story actually. <laughs> <laughs> kind of, kind of. That's what we're here for. Yeah. <laughs> So, uh, so like I said, we started when I was in third grade. So I went to elementary school through second grade. Right. Um, both of my parents are, um, were, my father passed when I was 14, actually, but um, both were um, computer science people. They both had degrees in computer science from, mm-hmm. you know, like from the beginning, they were sort of pioneers in that. So very science, math-oriented people. Okay. Um, and when I was in first grade, apparently, like, our whole class just happened to be fairly talented at math. We were doing second grade math by the end of the year. We had a really great first grade teacher. Yeah. And then we hit second grade, and the teacher was very by the book. And she was, like, just giving us all of this math work to do over again. And I was getting bored um, and, like, really bored. And my parents were like, oh, shit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, like, the, the we see this happening. Um and so they they asked they even asked my teacher if they if she could give me harder things and she was like oh yeah once she finishes what she has <laughs> they were like oh my <laughs> so they looked into Montessori school for us we actually almost went to Montessori school but um, we had cousins who were homeschooling at the time um, and so that's how we heard about it and so we decided to try homeschooling and then and we for like two weeks we tried to sit down at you know the kitchen table with a textbook did not work for us we just that's not our family style you know we're very like flowy and you know so um so that's how that's how we got into it that was the impetus um was that I was starting to hate math and even I I I was a little bit I don't want to say ruined (laughs) but like a little bit ruined by even by the time we got there like my parents were like okay Laura like you got to learn your multiplication tables and I would be in tears because I didn't think that I could do it anymore because I hated it so much. Yeah. Um, and being that we were homeschooling or unschooling even, you know, um, they were like, okay, what if we give you like a $50 gift card at Toys R Us if you learn your times tables? I still didn't do it. Yeah. I still just couldn't do it. And so I never got that $50 gift card, which was very sad. Yeah. And I learned consequences. <laughs> but um, Mike, we, ha- we have a deal that like, if, I'm like, if you guys get straight A's, I'll give you $100. I have yet yeah. to get, ever have to give away Yeah, $100. no, it, it doesn't work. <laughs> no, it, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. But what I learned from that, just from the experience overall, was by, you know, by the time I got to high school age, I knew that I wanted to go on and go to college and I knew I wanted to be sort of intellectually matched with my peers. I knew I wanted the equivalent of a high school diploma. So we belonged to like this homeschool co-op and they had classes twice a week that Mm -hmm. were high school level classes. Mm -hmm. So I signed myself up for the, like we, we had been going there for forever, but I chose the classes that I wanted to do. And I remember, I think it was like ninth or 10th grade or something like that. I signed up for, um, a physics class, which was like a 12th grade level physics class and geometry without ever having done algebra and yeah. did fine. I took, I took geometry before I took algebra. Yeah, it, it was fine. Like I, I sailed right through, like, you know, I had to no, learn I'm a little a bit of algebra. I took but... algebra too before I took geometry because I was scared of geometry. Oh, okay. I actually but liked geometry. I can, I can like, do advanced level math, but like spatial things like freak me out. I was like, wait a minute, that didn't sound right. Yeah. Um, no, yeah. See the thing, like, I'm good at math. I just, I thought that I hated it, but because my parents didn't force me to do it when I clearly didn't want to do it, I had that space to be like, oh, like, and then when I finally one step in front of the other got to the point where I was like, I have this dream of getting a high school diploma. Mm -hmm. Here's the next step to do it. It was fine. It was fine. Yeah. And I know a lot of parents who homeschool get afraid of kids getting behind and whatever but it's but what does behind mean (laughs) yeah right what does it mean behind right Right. so like i mean i was i was usually a straight a student usually 
um, I had some abuse stuff. And so I spent, I was the kid in ninth grade that was like, how low can my grade be? And actually finish this test. <laughs> it was like, can I pull off like the lowest grade possible, but actually finish the test? Boundary pusher. Yep. Oh, well, I was angry at the world. So, yeah. um, but what does behind mean? You know what I mean? Like, so I did that in my ninth grade year and I still graduated 14th of my class. Right. You know, so like what, what is behind me? It's, it's, it, everyone's different. It's a construct. It's a construct. Um, my 17 year old was a preemie, like super duper teeny tiny and, and physically she's fine, but intellectually there's some massive struggles. So like, it's going to take her longer. Okay. Okay. So what? So it takes her longer. It, but it yeah. panics people. Yeah. And, and I know, like, my husband is a former teacher, and, and I, we disagree on this sometimes because I'm like, if, if they don't do their homework, that's on them. Yeah. Like, us yelling about it isn't going to solve anything. Yeah. You know, all it's, all it's going to do is become that thing. Yeah. And, you know, I don't want to contribute to that. I don't want to contribute to anything that makes them not want to learn something. Right. Right. Yes. You know, so like that's very unschooling of you. <laughs> <laughs> oh God! Um, well, I just like, you know, but I know that I was a straight A student not because I loved learning, but because I liked how I felt when they approved of me because of my grades. Yeah, you know, because I didn't at home they didn't, but like yeah. teachers loved me. Yeah, um, I'm still friends with you know a lot of I, I'm still friends with some of my high school teachers. So, um. And I, th I do think that sometimes the kids who excel in standard, organized education tend to be those people pleaser kids. Yeah. You know, and I, people pleaser kids tend to grow up and have jobs that they hate. Mm hmm. You know, I was talking with my mom the other day and she was just remarking about how, like, proportionally, how many unschoolers tend to be entrepreneurs. Yeah. And we're talking about why that is. And, yeah. you know, I think a lot of it has to do with, well, we grew up knowing that we could do whatever we set our minds to because that's all we had. Yeah. You know, like, and our parents pushing us toward discovery and things like that. Yeah, like, that's what thing. you need to do. But, like, yeah, but, we, you know, we pursued what we wanted to pursue and we succeeded at it generally. If not, we learned from that too. Right. But, you know, there's that, um, there's that confidence of knowing how to fail and, and how to succeed. Right. That leads into entre entrepreneurship really well. That's so funny. I do not consider myself entrepreneurial at all. Mm -hmm. I just don't follow direction well. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, I think, I think when, you've, when you come from trauma, mm -hmm. you either become a people pleaser or you become a fuck y'all, I know what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. Like I've lived this long. Fuck y'all, I know what I'm doing. And I'm, I'm a fuck y'all, I know what I'm doing. <laughs> Sorry. I, you know, it's just, it's, you know, here we are in the yeah. midst of a, oh, I've never even watched a podcast. I should have one. Um, <laughs> I've seen some now. Um, but, you know, there, it's, there's this weird societal thing about folks who don't do what's considered the normal. Yeah. You know, it's like, okay, well, you're a grown up now, so you got to be an adult. I'm like, well, what does that mean? Right. Right. You know, I, rem I remember my parents, my, my, my parents were toxic to each other, but I remember this one fight that my folks were having. And my dad used to play guitar and he would draw and he was quite good at it. And my mother would harp on him about how adults don't do that. You're a dad now. You don't get to do that stuff anymore. And I was like, fuck oh all my God. that. And so he never did. He stopped. Yeah. He stopped playing guitar. I mean, he would collect them. Yeah. But he didn't play them. Oh, that's he tragic. Played, he, like, he played guitar and banjo, and he stopped playing both those. Oh, he, I keep, every time I hit this, every single time. Um, I'm a flailer. <laughs> uh, it's just what I am. So, like, I remember that, that struck me. I mean, as toxic as the relationship with my father was, and that was also abusive, I remember going, I would never want to make someone feel like they could, they had to stop being who they are just because they reached a certain age. Yeah. That's awful. It's tragic. It's, it is absolutely tragic. Um, I had a friend a couple of years ago who, I feel like it was a similar idea where I don't know, like we've been friends for like, two decades and I hadn't realized I hadn't heard from her in a while. And so I messaged her and I realized, Oh, we're no longer connected on Facebook. Huh. 
I still have her phone number memorized, text. And so I text her going, hey, I haven't heard from you. Is everything okay? Like, what happened? Did, did like, your Facebook get hacked? Like, you know what happened? And she sends me this long diatribe about how, like, I, I need to learn how to grow up. And, you know, I keep chasing this pipe dream and this, that, and the other. And how, like, I'm a bad influence on my children because I won't grow up. Oh, I'm like, man. you hate your job. Like, yeah. You hate your job. You got married when you thought you were supposed to. Mm-hmm. You never had children because you thought you couldn't afford it. Yeah. You hate that. But you're mad at me for doing those things because I didn't have the right to do them when I did them? That's what she wants. That's why she's mad. But I think that happens. I think that we get so yeah. wrapped up in what am, I, what am I supposed to be doing? Like, what's the expectation? What do people expect from me? Mm-hmm. And we don't take that step back and go, but what do I want to do? Right. Even me, even me who grew up being, you know, with parents who were like, what do you want to do? You know, like what interests you? Like even me, like I feel that societal pressure too, right? Yeah. Like I, I got into this field and was like, oh no, I have to like really want to be an acupuncturist. Right. right. Yeah. Oh, man. Yeah. Society's hard sometimes. It, it, it is. Um, you know, and I am, I am a 53-year-old woman who's not the skinniest thing on the planet trying to get into television. Uh, and so, like, I'm trying not to, like, be like, it's okay. This is okay. This, mm-hmm. this is okay. Like, you know, like, we, we tell ourselves, we hear these things over and over again, and then we start to think that they're true. And, and, I, and I think it's, like, the saddest it's so incredibly sad to me when, when people want things and they don't because they're so afraid of it. Yeah. And then they get mad at you for doing it. Yeah. But more they get mad at themselves for still wanting it. Mm-hmm. I, have, I, have a, I have a friend. I won't drop names. Um, not you, Stacy. I'm sorry. So, of course, Stacy gets called out all the time because like, she's <laughs> one of my dearest. And so another friend, you know, is like, I think she's in her 60s now. And she'd always wanted to perform. And she never allowed herself to do it because she thought she wasn't enough or, or it was silly or, you know, she's supposed to be a mom. She should be doing that. But then her kids were doing it. And then she, she wanted it so bad. And now she's starting to do it. And fuck, she like gets cast in things all the time. <laughs> and it's, I mean, it's glorious to watch. But, yeah. you, but you still see, you can still like... Even through just like Facebook posts, you can you can just like see her struggle with, I love this. I'm not supposed to. Yeah, yeah. And I'm sure she's getting pushback from somebody. You know. Um, good for her. Though. Like, good for That's her. So listen, oh. I was like the first time when she was like, I auditioned for a musical. I'm like, fuck oh. yes, you did. <laughs> yes, you did. Um, it's yeah. I love. I love. I love. And I think it's one of the reasons I wanted to talk to you because like I love seeing people do things that seem impossible, mm. even if it just seems impossible to them. Mm. Okay. So I have a patient and one of the things I love to ask my patients, especially the first time they come in is what do you love to do that you can't do anymore because of what's happening? Right. right. And one of them, um, she is um, old older like you know late 60s okay so um, i was about to say watch it <laughs> right i know I, I do have to be careful with this but um, <laughs> but i'm um, a really young 53 <laughs> <laughs> um recently left her abusive husband which i'm like already oh like at her age right like right. moved out on her own probably for the first time you know oh, yeah. in like decades yeah right. if ever if right ever, yeah. yeah she moved out on her own so proud of her she was in um such physical pain and um and emotional pain depression right so i asked her you know what's something that you love to do that you're just not doing these days and she said i used to love to sew and she was like i just can't any i can't sit there and hold the thing and i i just can't sew anymore and she like literally tears down her face right and i was almost right there with her like it has it's hard sometimes to have boundaries you know yeah. when when you get into somebody's like what they love it that they can't do mm. and so um and so we we you know and i i don't um i'll treat anybody regardless of ability to pay she um she's very limited income because of her situation at this point she pays like ten dollars every time she comes yeah. in and i love to see her i love seeing her every time she comes in because she always has this big smile on her face no matter what and so we've been working together we work together for you know a couple of months and every time I'd say 
you know, I, I, have you looked at the sewing machine? Have you like, are we moving toward that yet? And finally, after a couple of months, you know, I said, how about that sewing machine? And she looked at me and she smiled and she said, I sat down and I did a little bit. <laughs> And I almost cried right then. <laughs> and this year for Christmas, we, we just got a new dog. And sometimes we bring the dog into the office. Yeah. And this year for Christmas, she sewed our dog a winter coat, up like a polar fleece winter coat and summer dress. <laughs> like, it's probably the, the gift that, yeah. like one of those, I, I it means so much to me that she I, did that. I love, th- I love that you... Sliding scale, folks. Because, like, oh, yeah. One of the things we, we it's did. It's like a was secret to, sliding scale, but it is, you know. You don't tell anybody. Yeah. Because <laughs> um, I feel like, okay, yeah, you didn't get the money from her, but you got other things. Oh, so much else. So much else. So we, we with, with Pippa and Lola's, we would donate mm-hmm. to um, domestic abuse mostly. Um, and sometimes I would get these notes from folks who, this thing that I gave them made their worst day better and so like yeah i mean yeah Yeah. i'm like i'm super broke but those notes yeah yeah i i have cards from this pay for that no i have cards from this person on my fridge that you make me cry to read them sometimes yeah Yeah. um (sighs) we we turned on the tipping feature on our on our credit card machine you don't ever tip back we're a medical you don't tip your doctors right we're a medical clinic but we turn that on and we tell people if you choose to tip this helps people who who otherwise can't afford services. So yeah. from a business perspective, we're not even losing anything by doing sliding yeah. scale. You know, we use that money yeah. and it works all around. And I, yeah, like I said, it's, it's only some my secret sliding scale, but yeah, we I, don't ever. I, I do feel like your average person, obviously there's going to be someone who takes advantage, but I think your mm-hmm. average person, when they see that, mm-hmm. will make up for it. Yeah. We did for a long time. We did, we had a pay what you can table. Okay. Before we started donating. Once we started donating, I realized I needed that those soaps for the donations. But yeah. um, we had to pay what you can table. And most people would pay its value, if not more. Mm-hmm. Obviously, there were some people who tried to take advantage. And usually, like, they were obviously wealthy. Oh, they yes. They would try to pay the least. Yeah. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. Yeah. But the idea was so that, you know, some little mm-hmm. eight-year-old could buy his mom a present. That was yeah. the idea behind it. But, yeah, I, I do feel like... Um, so I used to run a theater company and we always would have a pay what you can night mm. and we generally made more money on pay what you can. Wow. Than we would on a, on a regular night. Wow. Cause I think, I think that people get it. And I think that the they, gratitude, they, they see what you're trying to do. Yes. And you know, I know that if I'm out at a restaurant and as, as poor as I am, if I notice somebody's being an extra, like an extra asshole to the wait staff, I will always tip extra Yeah, to try to make up for it. I, I think, I think, I think more people do that than not. Yes. Yeah, I think so too. Um, I do think that in general, the world is full of, of good people. Um, I would agree with that. Yeah. I, I have more optimism than I, I think a lot of people do. Yeah. I think my stomach's growling. <laughs> I forgot to eat lunch. <laughs> this is bad. I'm doing two podcasts back to back. This is bad. I'm going to have to go get a smoothie between. Um, Homer, Alaska. Mm-hmm. Talk to me about Homer, Alaska. Oh my God, it's my favorite place in the entire. I'm wearing a Juno, Alaska shirt today. So, uh, did you live in Alaska? Are you from Alaska? No, no, my soul lives there. Okay, it, it pops back and forth. You why, know, why Homer? <laughs> um, I I just feel at home there. So, um, the first time I went was in 2014. One of my dear friends from acupuncture school is from there. Okay. Um, she grew up there and, um, and one break, you know, she was like, do you want to come visit Alaska with me? I'm going home. And I was like, yeah, I want to go. Yeah. And (laughs) I got there and suddenly everything was magical. It was like, there's something about the wilderness. I think like everything is wilderness. Even when you're in the city, like even the bigger cities, you're just surrounded by wilderness and you can't escape it. And there's something so humbling about that. You know, there's something so like, like you cannot extract yourself from the rhythms of nature when you're there. And I love that inability to extract because here, like we're so disconnected, you know, we can be in a big city and not see, like we can see trees that someone has planted for the aesthetics or whatever, but like you don't see the forest. You don't see like the bears that are going to eat you, 
in the forest, right? Right. Um, Or the moose that will charge you down. (laughs) And they're huge. They're huge and they're really freaking scary. Um, Yeah, they're... um, That's interesting because I... One of the things I like about Pittsburgh is mm -hmm. for being a city, Mm -hmm. there's a lot of nature. There is. Yeah, there is. Because I've lived in some towns that do not. But still, there's... You know what? It was really interesting. So this last time that we went, we went up for um, Thanksgiving this year. Mm -hmm. um, And we went to Juneau, first time in Juneau, um, sort of on the way back. Hence the shirt. (laughs) I love this freaking... This fox is just so... I actually painted... I, I have a painting that I did that looks similar with the really? one. With, well, it has like two eyeballs peeking yes. out, but just like yeah, the I tail love the and the one eyeballs. eye and the yeah, um, yeah. It's anyway, but we um, we took like a self tour of the state capitol building, and there's like no one there because it's the holidays and whatever. Right. So the secretary um, came out and she's like, "Do you want to see the senate chamber?" And we were like, "Yeah." Yes. So we went and we were asking her all these questions about like the senate chamber, and one of the things that my mom asked her was, um, "You know, is there much um, like?" It, is the polarization there politically as bad as it is in the rest of the country? And she said, no, absolutely not. She said that there are, oh shoot, I'm going to forget the numbers. There are something like 18, I think, um, members of the Senate were part of the bipartisan committee and Mm -hmm. only three of them were not. They were all really hard right Republicans um, that just refused to work across the lines. Mm -hmm. Everyone else worked across the lines. And I find that that's true in a lot of Alaska, even though there's, you'll find like really like across the variety of political, religious spectrums, right. um, people work together because you have to, because you're all in the wilderness. Cause right, because you'll die otherwise. It's very neighborly. It's very community oriented, you know? And so even though there are fights, obviously, like obviously. people are people. and But to me, there's still this sense of kind of, we're going to survive this winter together. Yeah, so I... Yeah, I, I've always been a little like obsessed with Alaska, and I've always wanted to do that that cruise along oh, yeah. the, the glacier. Uh, I don't do dark well. Okay, and I lived in Seattle for a couple of years, and that got too dark, and I was like, "There's no way I could handle Alaska." It's such a beautiful darkness, though. I mean, like I've only been there twice in the it's winter. It's dusky, right? It's yeah, like it's a dusk. golden hour. Yeah, you know, it's always slanted because the sun is just so low, and it lasts a long time. It's like it's always sunrise and sunset, which right. I think is beautiful. And to be fair, I haven't done a whole winter there yet. Yeah, someday I will, but I haven't done it yet. So maybe I would feel differently, you know. Come. So what would March. you have to do to go? But well, <laughs> I'd have to sell my business, yeah. right? And so that's. A, Literally, that's kind of part of it. Part of it's like, I want to be able to sell my business so I can buy a house in Homer and retire there. <laughs> and until Lovely. then, I'll just go and, um, you know, maybe I can like do acupuncture relief work or something. Because there are acupuncturists in Homer, you know, maybe I can go up for a month or something and yeah. let them take their vacations. And, yeah. um, you know, I'll just visit as often as I can until then. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I, love, I love how different people are and like what they like and what they don't like i grew up in a small town i i don't find comfort in small towns Mm -hmm. i've i they feel dangerous to me interesting but that's any harm that has come my way has happened in small towns okay so that makes sense right um I feel I can walk through Manhattan at one o'clock in the morning by myself and feel perfectly fine. Thanks very much. So, you know, but everyone's different, right? You know, so I, I, I find that, I find that interesting. I actually took Bruce um, to New York for the first time and he's from a small town in Oregon. Mm-hmm. And cause we had talked about like, before we ended up moving here, we had talked about going to New York. I'm like, okay, you've never been. I know how overwhelmed you get in Seattle. Mm-hmm. It's a different animal. Like, I mean, Seattle's a big, I mean, yeah. Seattle's a big city. It's a half a million people in a very small enclosed space because the, the lakes kind of forced it to be, you know, mm-hmm. enclosed. Um, but it ain't Manhattan. So, uh, yeah, we got, we, we left the, <laughs> we left uh, Penn Station and instant overwhelm. I was like, yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> I love, I, like, I want to be here a lot. I love you more. We're not doing that. Um, but he has discovered he really likes Brooklyn. So that okay. might, that might be an eventual, maybe someday after the kids graduate from high school, maybe. Cause I think if I move Perrin one more time, he'll have her all over heads. <laughs> he does not handle change. Well, I'm all about it. I'm like, yeah. what's different now? Let's go. And he's like, you got rid of the microwave, but I loved that microwave. <laughs> so, like, he just cannot. What was it? We just did. We just, we just changed. Oh, we uh, we got new cabinets in the kitchen, right? Not because we were buying cabinets, but because we had the ones from the store. 
and we needed a place to put them. And Bruce was like, well, I don't like the shelving we have. We'll bring this metal shelving home and we'll turn that into our kitchen shelving. Okay, okay. cool. I thought Perrin was going to just completely implode because it was another change. Oh, no. Because it completely changed the look of the kitchen. Yeah. Because they were like, there was doors before, complete, and now it's open and you can see the window behind it. Like it's it's a completely open, and it with his head. Yeah. He did not like that at all. Does not handle change well. Mm. Um, but I think it's because he's had so much of it. Yeah. In his entire life. He's like, so I, I can see Perrin being the guy who buys a house at 21 and never leaves it ever. <laughs> <laughs> he's like, this is where I live. I'm never going. You're going to have to pull me out of here on a stretcher. Like I'm not going. Um, whereas I moved so much as a kid, I, like after five or six years, I'm like, okay, I got to, <laughs> I got to get out of here. I got to rearrange the entire house. Like it's making me crazy. It's too much of the same. Um, so yeah, that's funny. Okay. So this is the other sort of standard question is like all things being equal. Money's not a problem. Like you don't have to like do anything crazy. Like what is your perfect life? What does that look like? Like, if your life was perfect, what would that look like? Oh, my God. That's a good question, too. Um, I think it's important. To, some people don't know. So I think it's important to ask yourself those questions. It, it is. It is. And, you know, I do this, like, ideal life visioning a whole lot um, mm -hmm. because I love it, because I like imagination, right? Mm -hmm. I like to write. I like to create with, yeah. Um, my, honestly, and, and this is the one, I'm going to call it sort of, like, concrete-ish dream. And that's not even a dream. It's something that I've known to be true about myself since I was uh, like a wee little one is uh, I want to be a philanthropist. Okay. I want to change the world with my money. So I always have known that like, that's, that's like my, like in a way, a love language, I guess, like giving money, like providing financial support to people who need it is what fills me up. Oh. Right. That's do you do that thing? Because like Bruce and I do that thing where like if I won the lottery, I would set up this foundation to give these people money. Yes. I would set up this foundation to give these people money. Like we would, like, we're like, well, we'll keep like fifty thousand of it for ourselves, and then everybody else would get. Yeah, I'm like, okay, I'll set this so much aside, and then I can like retire to Alaska, mm -hmm. and I can or travel to Alaska if I want to. I love to travel too, so my ideal yeah. life includes a whole lot of world travel, um, you know, and um, and I have horses, so my ideal life includes like, you know, being able to provide for my very expensive horses that I love. Horses are expensive. <laughs> They're so expensive. I have a couple of friends. Of horses yes yeah. yeah they're wonderful they're so expensive right um so you know out of really big spendy dogs right? yeah yeah <laughs> um having space too for me having having time is like the biggest um luxury for me so mm -hmm. having having time that i can sit and rest and be creative in order to then go out and just explode and explore and discover and learn and be curious and then come back and rest so having the time to do that but also having the space to do that because I have kind of a big bubble of I, I'm an introvert and I have my you know my need to like be by myself for a while and so and that's kind of translates into physical space so we live in the country right now we have like 10 acres and that's perfect for me so I need my ideal yeah. life includes like nature space to be to come back to to reset and then go back out into the world and like shower people with money. <laughs> I realized I was, because everyone always says I'm an extrovert. Like that's mm -hmm. what people always think that. I'm like, yes, and. Mm -hmm. I love being with one or two people. Yeah. One or two people fuels me. Yeah. 10. It's a lot. Especially if, if I'm expected to be on mm -hmm. in some way. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like if it's, if it's just a bunch of us like hanging out at my house and we're just like hanging, but like we'll have game night and like, mm -hmm. I'll have like 25 people in my house. And I'm like, cool. I love y'all. I'm going to bed. Mm -hmm. You can stay. <laughs> I'm like, I like you being here. I'm going to go outside. <laughs> like, yeah. I'm going to go over there. You guys do your thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm going to have to, <laughs> this is not the first time. <laughs> I can't hear it for what it's worth. <laughs> oh God. I know, I know sometimes it picks it up when my friend Chad was here, <laughs> my stomach kept growling. He's like, why didn't you eat before? I'm like, cause I didn't think about it. <laughs> There's things I can't feed myself. I can, I just, I'll eventually. Um, so like what kinds of things do you do? Like I, I'm a big believer in do one thing every day mm -hmm. towards your dream. Mm. So some days it's three, some days it's none, but it balances out to at least a thing a day. Yeah. So do you have some kind of either a daily practice or a weekly practice or um, do you keep lists or whatever where you're like, okay, 
that's what I want. How do I get from here to there? Yeah. Um, so I, I, I'm not a super ritualistic person. I can't say that I have like a routine that, you know, I get up in the morning and I meditate or anything like that. Like, um, I don't have that, but a habit that my brain has gotten into is that future visioning being like, okay, so like I'm driving along in my car and just like feeling like I have, you know, the seven figure clinic that I'm building, right? right? Just what does this feel like? Like embodying that is mm. something that I love to do. That gives me a whole lot of energy. That really drives me a whole yeah. lot. Strategic planning again. I also, <laughs> I love to sit down and make those lists. Like here's my projects that I want to do and here's how I'm going to do them and I'm going to assign this to that person. And I love, you know, yeah. that sort of, like it's a little bit like writing, you know, yeah. in that way. Um, yeah. Writing is another thing that actually gives me a whole lot of, it's a break from, um, from actually thinking about business. It like yeah. makes me sit back and get back into my more creative, imaginative zone. So I'll do that too. What kind of writing? Uh, it, fiction, mostly. Like I have a story that I'm working on right now. That's, do you do short stories? Do you novellas? Novellas, I would say. Okay. Yeah. All right, that's mm -hmm. fair. Yeah. That's cool. Have you ever published anything? Not really. Have you tried to publish anything? No, I have not. Okay. Well, no, no, for sure. You can't I mean, publish something if you uh, don't I've like published like editorials and articles and things mm -hmm. like that. Um, cause I'm good at that too. Um, but yeah, I love nothing having fiction. written. Yeah. The process of writing is like, let me open up a vein and throw it all, you know? <laughs> um, yeah. I love having written mm -hmm. cause I've written a lot. I, I, uh, I was like a columnist for a newspaper and oh. uh, in one of my incarnations. <laughs> oh, that's cool. <laughs> <laughs> I've lived a lot of lives. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's what I, I was curious. Do you ever, like, in your writing, do you ever, like, manifest, you know, like, where in your stories perfect life exists? Like, when I was that? a kid, that was, that was like, 100% the stories I would write. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, my name is Erica. I am 11 years old, and I have 100 <laughs> horses and 100 dogs and 100 <laughs> cats. And <laughs> You're like, That's this, is what, this is what my life looks like. Yeah. Well, they say write what you know. Right, exactly, yeah. Oh my gosh. I I, I want to say thank you for coming. I realize that as um as a practitioner of oriental medicine, um being in front of a camera is not necessarily <laughs> like a high on your list of priorities. Yeah. Um so I know I appreciate it's you fun. you coming and and taking the time and and talking with us about this stuff. It you know, this You're what my seventh guest, I think. I think, yeah, I think you're my Ooh, seventh. Yeah, that's I know. a good number. I know. Is there isn't there supposed to be something like spiritual about seven? Yeah, it's um. Oh, I'm gonna get it wrong. There is something. It's like a sacred number. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, but so I, I appreciate you coming and being here, being part of my weird dream that I'm oh, making this is happen. Fun. It's this so is much so fun. fun. <gasps> it was so nice. It's, it's it's nice to get to talk to you. Yeah. Because in like, person, in person, this is our first time being in the same space. Yeah. So, um, I think that's also part of the reason I wanted to do this podcast because, like, you're this was the first time I got to be in the same space with you. Same time uh, with St uh, Steve, who came a couple weeks ago. It's the first time getting to be in the same space with him. So it's like, okay, all right, I could like actually get to know these people because <laughs> that's fun for me. Um, you know, like I love one of my favorite things in the world is like, wh why do we do what we do and what makes people tick? Mm -hmm. So me I think, too. I think it's fascinating. Yeah. Um, cause we all come to things from different places. And even if we come from similar places, we end up in different. That's why I love to write. I love to create characters that have been from different places and come together and interact with each other. Yeah. And how does that happen? How does that manifest? What comes out? Like, a bunch of my characters, I didn't even sit down and plan out who they were. They just appeared in the story. And I was yeah. like, oh, shit, you're a person. <laughs> yeah. Isn't that you fun? Know? Yeah. And so I've written children's books. And um, and I had this one that I, I had this whole series of these children's books. Evie is as real a person to me as my own children mm -hmm. because I spent so much time with her. Yeah. You know, um, right now I, I'm writing I'm writing a television show. Uh but Katie is very, Katie is very real to me, mm -hmm. you know, um, and it's, and it's interesting because like they become like your friends. Yes. You know, and yeah. it's like, is this what ma imaginary friends started as? Is like someone just like making stories of, you know, what they wanted yeah. life to look like. 
you know yeah um i just i love that shit yep i too. love that shit i love it too <laughs> anyway thank you so much thank you um, and thank you guys for being here and part of us and keep on dreaming and that's that <laughs>